Listen Only mode. Hello everyone, I'm Sean Esterly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and welcome to today's webinar which is being hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with the United Nations Foundation's Energy Access Practitioner Network. And today's webinar is um, focused on energy access towards universal energy access in Ghana. And one important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practices, resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. And you have two options for audio today. You might either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you do choose to listen to your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing so will just eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. And if you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option. And then a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin that you should use to dial in. And panelists, just uh, another reminder to please mute your audio device while you are not presenting. And if anyone is having technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the uh, Go to webinar's help desk number, which is displayed at the bottom of the slide, and that number is 888-259-3826. And we encourage anyone from the audience to ask questions at any point throughout the webinar. Uh, to ask a question, simply submit it through the question pane of the GoToWebinar window. I will receive them through there and present those to the panelists during our question and answer session. And if you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you will find PDF copies of the presentation at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training. And you may follow along as our speakers present. Also, an audio recording of the presentations will be posted to the Solution Center training page within about a week of today's broadcast. And we are also now adding um, webinars to the Solution Center YouTube channel where you'll find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. And today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Aniri Patel, Wisdom Ahia Tuku, uh, Tugobo, Paula Edze, Ishmael Eje Kumhini, and Kwasi Ugie Nimbotin. Aniri from the UN Foundation will be providing an overview of the Energy Access Practitioner Network, and then panelists will share their reflections on various priorities, approaches, and ongoing efforts on electrification in the country, and then showcase how pr practitioners can engage in off-grid business opportunities. And before our speakers begin their presentations, I just want to provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative. And then following the presentations, we will have a question and answer session where panelists will address questions submitted by the audience, some closing remarks, and then wrap up with a brief survey. Now this slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solutions Center came to be formed. And the Solutions Center is one of 13 initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial that was launched in April of 2011. It's primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other CEM partners. So now comes to this year. The initiative includes support of developing countries and emerging economies through enhancement of resources on policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as the webinar you are attending today. And the Solutions Center has four primary goals. The first goal is to serve as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. Second is to share policy best practices data and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. And third is to deliver dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And then lastly, the center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation from around the globe. And our primary audience is energy policy makers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries. But we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. And one of the, oh, back one slide, Heather. Uh, one of the marquee features that the Solution Center provides is the no-cost expert policy assistance, known as Ask an Expert. And the Ask an Expert program has established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries at no cost. So, for example, in the area of energy access and rural electrification, we're very pleased to have Ibrahim Raymond 
director of the Social, Social Transformation Division with the Energy and Resources Institute, serving as one of our experts. So if you have a need for policy assistance in energy access, rural electrification, or any other clean energy sector, we do encourage you to use this valuable service. And again, it is provided to you free of charge. So to request assistance, simply go to cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert and submit your request through the form on that page. So in summary, we encourage you to explore and take advantage of the Solution Center resources and services, including the expert policy assistance, the database of clean energy policy resources, subscribe to our newsletter, and participate in webinars like this one. And so now I'd like to provide brief introductions for today's distinguished panelists. Uh, the first speaker we'll be hearing from is Aniri Patel, officer at the UN Foundation's Energy Access Practitioner Network. And then following Aniri will be Paula Edze. Paula is the National Coordinator for Sustainable Energy for All, also known as C4ALL, implementation in Ghana. And following Paula, we will be here from Wisdom Ahia Tugolo, the Director of Renewable Energy at the Ministry of Energy in Ghana. And Wisdom has also, was also instrumental in the development and passage of Ghana's Renewable Energy Act. And then we will hear from Ishmael Eje Kumhini. Ishmael is the director of KITE. Additionally, he has been managing the KITE office in Kumasi and has been a member of the KITE management committee since 2003. And then our final speaker today is Kwasi Ugyanam Boteng. And Kwasi is the marketing manager for Wilkins Energy Engineering Limited, a private renewable energy company based in Accra, Ghana. And he has overseen the implementation of various projects, including the installation of solar systems for community health posts in rural Ghana over the past eight years. And so now with those introductions, uh, please join me in welcoming Aniri to the webinar. And in area, just remember to uh, bring your microphone off from mute. There you are. Should be. Okay. Easy. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Hi. No uh, uh, thanks. I'd like to thank uh, Sean and the Clean Energy Solution Center and all our esteemed panelists today for uh, putting together what I think is a really excellent webinar on the exciting um, energy access work happening in Ghana. Um, let's see. Okay. So uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, the Energy Access Practitioner Network is uh, was formed in 2011 as, as, in, as in support of the Universal Energy Access Goal of Under Sustainable Energy for All. We have 1,700 members from around the world that are uh, practitioners who are delivering energy services on a day-to-day -day basis on the ground. And what we do is try to showcase and provide visibility to some of the best-in-class uh, companies and non nonprofits in the space. Uh, from a survey we did with 141 members, they have electrified over 50 million households, and that's just a small subset of the network and what it's capable of and what it can do. Uh, we are in 191 countries from all over the world, and uh, our information clearinghouse is on www.energyaccess.org, and I'll share a little bit more about what kind of um, uh, stuff we have on the website. So uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, we provide um, a lot of market-based mini-grid and off-grid solutions, and we showcase um, the best-in-class uh, energy service deliveries at the country level. We also promote the adoption of new technologies and uh, innovative uh, financial and business models, the best practices on peer-to-peer -peer learning. And if you can see from the uh, graph here, uh, we have um, small and medium enterprises as what would, I would say is the largest per, uh, percentage of our network. So we have a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, many who have started companies or initiatives within the past three years. So there's a lot of opportunities for learning in this network, especially on what we think are some of the models that need to be replicated. 
Uh, we also have members from other kinds of sectors, such as government, international organizations, academic research institutes, and others as well. Um, then in our network, we also say the majority of our network is in the solar industry, but we're technology agnostic. We allow um, any uh, service energy service provider that has a renewable energy technology to join. So we have representatives from biomass, from the microgrid sector, um, efficiency, as you can see. And I would also say that um, some this this uh, snapshot of our global network is probably similar to the Ghana to the work in Ghana as well, as a majority of the Ghanaian practitioners are in solar as well. Also, you can see that the majority of um, the challenges that members face uh, are in, in access to funding and also in uh, a renewable energy enabling policy environment. So I would also argue that this is similar for Ghana as well, but um, we do have a representative from the government who can kind of share what is going on in the country as well. So. Um, Okay, some of the network accomplishments we have um, to date. Uh, we have produced a report in support of Rio Plus 20 on achieving universal energy access. And what we did was we put, uh, compiled um, recommendations from many different practitioners on what is needed. And that's also available for download on our website. We have also created an import tariff and barriers to entry database, which is a global database of um, countries' uh, current tariff inbound and duty rates. And you can also access uh, Ghana's uh, tariffs rate as well, especially for practitioners who are interested in doing business there. Uh, we worked with the IEC to reduce cost barriers to assessing quality standards and uh, have a discount available for practitioner members. Um, and we've also compiled an investment directory showcasing the deal flow for about 140 companies that responded um, and what the funding needs are in the sector, which we showcase regularly to investors. Um, and last, we also have established an energy and women's health initiative as a high impact opportunity under sustainable energy for all. And what that is, is looking at the thousands of clinics in the world that lack access to reliable electricity for health services. And we are con currently conducting a scoping study in five priority countries looking at the needs assessments for various health clinics. And Ghana is one of those uh, priority countries. So we're excited to also work on this, especially with practitioners who could provide those kinds of solutions. We launched and supported the Sustainable Energy Network Ghana in May of 2013, and Ishmael will present more on this, but I wanted to showcase um, about our partnership in which we have 147 Ghanaian members registered in the Energy Access Practitioner Network, which really shows critical mass and why we felt the need to establish an affiliate network or help support and establish uh, the affiliate network there. Um, in the practitioner network, we have 295 members um, globally who indicate operations in Ghana. So clearly there are a lot of business opportunities in the country and um, the, I'll let the other panelists uh, discuss more of what those look like. And in our uh, network, we also have even representation from government, civil society, and private sector, which is also a little unusual considering our network is more focused for um, practitioners. But I think that also shows um, the promise in Ghana that the sectors are talking to each other. Um, I also wanted to quickly go over some of what we think are the interesting uh, companies in Ghana uh, doing interesting work. So persistent energy partners in Ghana are developing very low cost um, microgrids on the village level and uh, providing basic uh, lighting and mobile phone charging. And, uh, and, and they're recently um, expanding. Uh, Wilkins Engineering, uh, which you'll hear from uh, later, uh, have a, a significant product range showing 
all the grid tied PV products all the way to small scale soil lantern distribution. Um, DOS Gift Quality Foundation is a really interesting NGO working um, to utilize microfinance uh, at the local level to really distribute clean energy products through women's groups and retail networks. And then uh, Energy Val is a uh, interesting uh, company that is uh, utilizing German innovation to bring uh, new and interesting uh, technologies um, to Ghana. Then we also have uh, Atlas Business Energy Systems, which uh, is started by a professor. And he's tailored his uh, classroom approach to really bring ex business excellence for um, his staff. So uh, that's a snapshot of the Energy Access Practitioner Network. And uh, we would love for you to join if you haven't already. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome Paula to the webinar for her presentation. And Paula, just remember that your microphone is uh, currently still muted. Hello, I think it is. My name is Paula Eje. I'm the ethical committee for Ghana. My presentation will be on Torres Universal access um, to Ghana, the role of the Sustainable Youth for All initiative. We look at two main things in my presentation, that is the SC for All initiative and the summary of Ghana's country action agenda, as it is now called, but what we actually have in Ghana is a country action plan. And then I'll look at the progress being made so far towards achieving lesser access to energy. So an overview of the SC4 initiative and a summary of Ghana's country action plan. As already mentioned, SC4 was initiated in September 2011 as a global initiative that would mobilize action from all sectors of society in support of three interlinked objectives. Energy access, energy efficiency, and renewable energy. And the target for 2030 is to ensure universal access to moving energy services to double the global rate of improvement of energy efficiency and also to double the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix. Ghana as a country was the first to actually develop and launch an action plan in May 2012, looking at three key objectives. This was based on some scoping and that was done on ongoing initiatives and progress that we've made so far. So Ghana is focusing on one, promoting productive use of energy two, to improve access to cleaner cooking option, looking at three key interventions, um, sustainable wood food oil production and improved food stove, increased access to LPG as a cleaner cooking option, and also the promotion of institutional biogas for cooking. Our third strategic objective is to provide access to electricity for remote communities using off-grid systems. A closer look at the first objective of Ghana's energy plan is the productive uses of um, looking at the key economic um, sectors of Ghana and its contribution to the GDP of Ghana, and um, focusing on the use of energy to, to um, increase agricultural productivity by um, using it in irrigation. So the sources we're looking at is solar, wind, mini hydro, and some other iron resources for agricultural productivity. Secondly, under productive uses, um, Ghana seeks to promote the use of solar dryers farm processing plants and non-professional platforms for garden and building and this is always adding value to agricultural produce and, and adding value to um, agricultural produce. Also in the area of fisheries, which is also a booming um, sector in Ghana with a lot of people weighed in agricultural ventures, efforts are being made to establish modern landing sites and cold storage facilities and also to promote um, agriculture and 
vetted and one of the waterways of Ireland is one of the um, key um, waterway source available for such ventures. The effort is to um, promote or to create medium scale and enterprises in the salt um, sector. And another objective too, that is improve access to clean African options, um, good fuel and improve food stocks. We are looking at developing policy and education for promotion and development of the clean food stock sector and also improving the capacity of local stock manufacturers to increase um, production and the quality of stores that are already being uh, manufactured on the Ghanaian market. The third is uh, towards um, the, uh, the fuel being that is sustainable charcoal production. So charcoal is one of the key fuel used by Ghanaian, especially in the urban areas. So we're looking at um, establishing wood fuel plantation for sustainable charcoal production, and this also has to do with the convention or the carbonization technology as well. Introducing efficiency in that aspect. Hi, Paula. Your audio is coming. Your audio is coming through a little quietly. Could you possibly speak closer to the microphone? Okay. So, um, the phone is um, towards um, hot. And unfortunately, I think we might have lost um, Paula from the line due to some technical difficulty. There we are. Oh, Paula, we can hear you again. Uh, but Hello. Hi, Paula. Yep. Um, why don't we go ahead and try to continue. Um, if we continue to have technical difficulties, though, we might have to move on to the next presenter. Can you hear me? Yes. Go, go ahead, Paula. Go ahead and continue. Okay. So the, the, the thing is um, towards research and development, that's engaging um, end users in the food um, production and design of improved food stores to make it and um, to to ensure that it actually meets um, the user's um, requirements, to promote research and development in improving and food stores and also um, good flow of production for um, cooking, and to also build the capacity of locals and to leverage common financing. In the area of um, promotion of LPG as a cleaner cooking um, option, we're looking at issues of supply, regulation, and also investment in the LPG infrastructure and also improving consumer um, access to the commodity through the reintroduction of the pleasure recirculation model. The third um, cooking option is um, the promotion of biogas for cooking, which is um, promoting the use of institutional biogas systems for cooking in letter public and schools, hospitals, and prisons. In the area of um, access to the city for remote communities using update systems, we're looking at a different um, set of um, technologies that is um, light and um, for lighting, um, education that is ICT in remote schools for health, and um, a sort of lighting, solar PV for lighting and refrigeration of um, medical um, supplies or batteries, and also solar home systems in the residential areas, especially the island communities or areas that could potentially not be reached by the great electricity and by the set in Canada and 20 and 16 targets by the um, government of Ghana. The fifth is um, the promotion of mini grid and um, renewable for the creation of island community. In terms of energy access and um, targets set um, by the government of Ghana, we hope to achieve 90 percent of uh, national education by 2050 and also increase the contribution of renewable energy by 10 percent or 500 megawatts in the electricity generation. By 2020. We also hope to have 50 percent of our population um, using LPG as their main source of um, cooking fuel by 2020 and also promote the use of food stoves, food stoves which will be adopted by 50 percent of the population by 2020. We recognize the fact that um, due to um, the, uh, the, the situation of some consumers in 
you might not be able to use LPG, which is quite expensive um, to use in terms of the initial investment of the um, initial investment into the equipment. The idea is to um, encourage users to rather use the open store instead of the conventional uh, or the traditional tools that we have on the market. The, the fifth for biogas is to have two hundred public institutions using biogas for um, cooking by in terms of progress made so far, um, as we speak now, we are about 80% of international electrification and for our oh, And we seem to be experiencing the technical difficulties again. Um, I think at this point we should move along to the next presenter. Um, and actually, wisdom. Oh. Hi, Paula. Hello. Hi, Paula. Um, we still seem to be having some technical difficulties Hello. with your audio. Um, why don't we can try to come back at that end? But I think at this point we um, are going to move ahead um, to Ishmael's presentation. Okay. Um, well, and yeah. The signal is slow because because the idea was to introduce my so you can hear and you can hear it. So Ishmael, um, we're going to move on to your presentation. You are still on mute. If you could go ahead and uh, take yourself off mute. Ishmael, you'll uh, need to unmute your microphone. You are still on mute. Ishmael, please uh, hit the microphone symbol next to your name to take yourself off mute. All right, we'll work on that. My, my apologies to, uh, to attendees. Uh, we'll have this worked out in just a second. All right, we're going to move along um, to Quasi's uh, presentation, and then we can always come back to Ishmael um, after that. So, um, Quasi, if you are ready, um, go ahead and take yourself off mute, and we'll give you the, the slides right now. And Quasi, you should be receiving the slide capabilities. Please take yourself off mute and accept the capabilities. Okay, I'm ready now. Very good. 
Okay. So thank you all. Once again, like you mentioned, um, for some reason my PDF is not coming up. So if either you can help me with that one. Yes, we're able to see it now. Oh. Okay. There you go. Yep. Okay. All right. Oops. Okay. So, like you rightly said, my name is Adeline Boateng. See, my presentation, what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to <coughs> talk as if I'm talking to people who, are, who want to have an idea of what the whole situation is like in terms of a private person's point of view and a practitioner in the energy market here in Ghana. And then we as Wilkins Engineering were established in 1993. And um, we operate in all the 10 regions of Ghana with um, business operations in Togo, Benin, and um, Liberia. We have focused on the rural and off-grid areas. Um, currently, we have served over some 50,000 customers in the past three years. And our strategy has been that in visiting these areas, we have realized that uh, initially the systems we go to the places with the solar systems, it's beyond the reach of people. People cannot pay for it. So we said, look, why don't we do um, systems, customized systems, small systems that people can come up with so typically we have systems ranging from 50 watts to 100 watt solar systems to even pico systems which are about 20 watts 15 watts 10 watts and then solar lanterns these are basically what we have offered to the market over the years let me go straight to the operations um, some of the difficulties for investors. If you are to come here as an investor or you want to consider entering the Ghanaian market, the energy situation here, what should be your, some of your expectations? First of all, um, there is this um, uh, difficulties, uncertainties of an emerging industry. The industry still now becomes um, an emerging one in terms of um, the renewable energy, for instance. So you have, I have here um, high risk, uh, high uncertainties and then low uncertainties. And then <coughs> on the high uncertainties, I, first of all, I consider things like buyer decisions. And the places where we are taking electricity to in the rural areas, um, apart from the fact that the technology we are taking there is new, the whole concept of electricity is also new to most of the people. So, for instance, after supplying electricity, um, a solar system, for instance, you would have to show the people how to operate the gadgets. A typical example is um, under the um, um, Ghana Energy Development and Access Project, there are some villages we are sending electricity to, solar systems, and then we, as part of the package we supply um, DC televisions and you realize that when you give the television to the person you also have to show the person how to operate a television. These are not people who can read and understand the manual, the user's manual, so you have to um, show them how to use the, the television. Now that alone brings itself some uncertainty. You are selling to people these buyers, they don't know the technology you are bringing to them. They don't trust it so much, and this it's a difficulty that anybody will have to surmount. And then we have um, the commitment of stakeholders. Here, stakeholders, I'm talking about the statutory bodies who are responsible for granting things like permits, licenses, certificates. So here you can talk about the um, energy commission, and the electricity department, the uh, electricity corporation, and then uh, even to some extent the Ministry of Energy, who are responsible for all these things. And sometimes it's difficult to know what the commitments of these stakeholders are, what their concentration is for a certain time, because these decisions are not only technical, sometimes they tend to be 
political also. Political in the sense that um, what has been the priority of a certain um, office, uh, of a certain regime or a certain government may not be the priority of another. Currently, there is the Vision 2020. I think Paula alluded to it as part of Ghana's uh, plan. My concern and our concern is this is not the first time we have seen such documents. We, way back in the 1990s, uh, there were other documents like that for uh, energy access, and but it was not pursued, it was not followed through. So you can see that these uncertainties are also there when it comes to the stakeholder and then the institutions that are there to provide it. And then we also go to the aspect of institutional capacities. Currently, um, I think what is one key thing that we need to see in the Ghana market to develop so that we take off very well is um, technology transfer. It's only recently that we have uh, two institutions that are pursuing renewable energy uh, studies, um, as the Kofuidia Polytechnic and the KNUST, that's the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, and um, um, a private um, um, school that is the Deng Solar Training Center. These are the only places where people can um, do uh, study for uh, or the industry can rely on for manpower in terms of these technologies. Mm. So that is also there. And then um, when we go to the other aspects of uncertainties, the economic landscape is there for you to also consider if, if you're operating in this um, space as a private practitioner. And the technology itself also is something that people have doubted. People have seen systems lie in the street um, in villages and you go to other places where the systems are not functioning. The systems work for let's say about um, <clears throat> a year or two and then you don't find the systems functioning again. That has been a cause of worry for the the, the customers. So this also becomes a difficulty that everybody will have to consider. The barriers, like I have said, the political barriers are there. The political way sometimes you find that it's not there. So something is written in document, something has been passed into law, but you don't see it being pursued, then um, you can only allude to it that the, the, the lack of political way. Ghana, for those of you um, who are here and are considering entering the Ghana market, fortunately for us, the Ghana market is, Ghana is not a place where you can say that there is political instability, no. But what um, I find to be of concern that anybody should consider is a political way, who will pursue what. The energy policies are there, we have signed onto a lot of agreements, we are partners with a lot of people. But then you consider what will be the priority of the next government or the next person in charge. For instance, currently the discussion in Ghana is about getting electricity. So it is not about which is cheaper or which is expensive. It's about getting electricity. There is um, a power rationing or a load schedule going on. So the concern here is about what adds up to the, the generation. So that one too is there. But um, in, in, in all this, you must also consider that Ghana, Ghana's budget is highly supported by donor agencies, and these development partners also have focus. So if um, this year, for instance, the Millennium Challenge account is going to be implemented, they're going to start, and you realize that it is going into the electricity sector. In that way, you can see that there's going to be a lot of development in electricity extension and supply to rural and off-grid areas. But what happens if, let's say, in the next year, donor partners who are our budgets, most part of our budget, they are supporting it, if they say, okay, now let's look at something else, water, sanitation, or other equally important things, then your plans um, for electricity also is stored. So that's some of the challenges here. 
regulation has also been um, a certain uh, bottleneck. Currently, if you want to operate as a, a renewable energy practitioner, you need a license from the Energy Commission. Apart from the license, if you want to build and operate um, renewable energy plants of a certain capacity, you need permits to site, another permit to construct, and another permit to operate or sell. I think all these um, processes are quite, they are too slow and the administrative bottlenecks are too much. It is also giving them um, a lot of problems to new startups and then uh, people who want to expand their operations. But I know some work is being done between the Energy Commission, PUIC, and the Ministry of Energy to make these processes quite seamless. I have already spoken about the technical capacities and then the institutional support. I think we should still see some uh, a lot of support in these areas for the market to really take off well. And then anybody who is entering this space would also want to be sure that there is financial support. Local banks, the rates we are doing here in Ghana are prohibitive for financing options. Um, Currently, the interest rate, for instance, is about between 28% to 32% on the borrowing, and this is too much. The dollar is depreciating to the, to the, and the CD is depreciating against the dollar, and that is also a cause for concern. Going to the higher scale, as you know, recently, about two years ago, the renewable energy law was passed. And we, last year, the feeding tariff was also gazetted. Currently, the cost of electricity averagely is about 15 Ghana pesos, and the feeding tariff rate, uh, the gazetted one, is also 40 pesos. Now, you look at it and you ask yourself who will go into this business where the user is paying 15 CDs and the feeding tariff is also 40 CDs. Why should I buy from renewable energy? And mind you, solar has the, the, the best of tariff compared to the other renewable uh, technologies. So you are asking yourself, why will electricity corporation, for instance, or Northern Electricity Department buy electricity from you 40 and then sell to somebody at 15? Something needs to change. Okay, so so having said all this, where are the opportunities? I I have currently in the last uh, weeks we have seen electricity tariffs are rising, an automatic adjustment strategy uh, formula is in place, and it gives opportunity to people who want to enter the market. In that, there are categories of um, customers who currently. They are paying about 70 Ghana pesos for electricity from the main grid. So, for instance, if you want to consider something like solar, then you can say that you can sell at a profit because these people are already buying um, at a higher uh, rate from uh, uh, normal grid electricity. So that could offer some opportunity for people who want to enter the space and can also um, boom, make the, the renewable energy market boom. So some, when it comes to these categories of customers, then you can say that we have reached great parity in this category of customers. But we are talking of these industries, uh, the banking institutions, the factories, these are down south in Accra, and where you have the maximum solar yield is also in the northern, uh, part of Ghana, and in, Ghana, in Accra too, you are fighting for land space, land acquisition is a whole uh, uh, hurdle that is not easy to break through, that one too is there. But I think if one can um, break that jinx, then you can consider um, cost that customer categories who are already paying more than solar could offer. Okay, the micro fits also looks promising. 
if uh, we get the, the fit. What we have currently is the normal feeding tariff, but the micro fits we're referring to things below 50 kilowatts. Um, if that can come on, the incentives there, people can move in where now people can think about even 2 kilowatts, 5 kilowatts on their roof, and this will increase the access to electricity, both in the cities and also in the villages. Okay. So in a nutshell, many of the issues that we are facing here in Ghana in the market, um, I think most of the market that are developed, I can see some people are um, from Europe, those of you in Europe, you also face all these things and then by now you have surmounted it. I know there are efforts on the part of government to overcome some of these barriers. And then um, it's not just a Ghanaian thing, it is um, everybody's um, business and I think together we can summons this. Okay, thank you very much. I can um, invite questions later. Great, thank you very much and um, I, we believe that we've worked out Ishmael's audio so we will now be going and turning it over to Ishmael for his presentation. Good afternoon everyone. Um, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here and um, I'm speaking specifically on the Sustainable Energy Networks of Ghana that um, I happen to be the interim chair and uh, it's going to be a brief presentation that, um, yeah, next slide please. Yeah, um, give you a brief, what I intend doing within this short time, give you a brief background to the establishment of the network, tell you what we're seeking to achieve with the network and touch on the current status of what the network is. Next slide, please. So, um, way back in 2008, we, we in Kite realized that it's important for us to continue to push the sustainable energy agenda and that the twin pillars of IRE, uh, renewable energy efficiency are lacking behind even though Ghana had a tremendous access rate. We had reached, at the time we had reached 60 percent, but realized that the contribution of renewable energy and energy efficiency were not that significant. So as part of the, next slide please. So we, 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 we created, we, we, we knew that it was very, very important for us to bring all our efforts together because there were challenges, as Kwesi just alluded to some of them. We realized that no individual could do it all by himself or itself, so we, we recognized there was a need for a concerted effort. So in 2008, next slide please. In 2008, we, we created a, a loose network out of a project that we implemented called uh, Affordable Lighting for All. We created a sustainable energy network, a uh, clean energy network as a loose network that aimed at promoting clean energy systems. Um, and following from that, next slide please. Once we created that network, we, we, we sought out to, at the time, the Renewable Energy Act was in the offering. So we, we decided to come together and present our position as a, a group of NGOs, private sector actors, to push for pro-poor and gender-sensitive renewable energy law. So that gave birth to send and we got that, this project, advocacy project, to, to ensure that the pro-poor issues and gender issues are addressed in the law. But we also had a mandate to ensure that the network is formalized and its scope broadened. Next slide. So when we, when in the process of formalizing the network, 
we realized that clean energy was a little bit restrictive in the sense that we're looking more at the renewables. So we, we changed the name to the Sustainable Energy Network so that it encompasses not just renewable but also energy efficiency as well. And uh, we had an inaugural meeting in April 2012. A committee was set up out of that meeting to put in place a governance structure including preparing a constitution. And then in the Q3, quarter 3 of 2012, we started collaborating with the Access Practitioners Network which culminated ultimately in the launching of the SENG in May 2013 as the first country affiliate of the Energy Access Practitioners Network. Next slide, please. So uh, what we are envisioning as a, as a network is um, a, a Ghana we envision a green Ghana within which the vast majority of consumers will be using sustainable energy. At the moment, it's still less than, less than I would say, less than two percent. And uh, the target, the national target, is to hit ten percent by 2030. So we are hoping that that be, that 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 target will be much bigger than what we have now. Next slide, please. And our goal is to create. We want to create a network, um, a network that is um, very influential and uh, we, to maintain an influential network of sustainable energy practitioners, service providers, researchers. To, and we are committed to facilitating the accelerated deployment and utilization of sustainable energy systems to underpin poverty reduction and economic development in Ghana. Next slide. And our objectives are, uh, there are quite a number of objectives that we're seeking to achieve. Uh, we want to champion and advocate the formulation of policies and regulatory measures that will help tackle some of the barriers that Kwesi touched on and ensure that the use of renewable energy and energy efficiency technologies are, are brought into the mainstream. We want to promote practical and affordable and effective best practices and strategies for adopting RE. Next slide, please. Sorry, the slides are taking a bit of time to, uh, to provide the information to the citizenry, to foster information knowledge sharing and to help promote capacity building and research. Essentially, if you remember the presentation Kwesi made, we're trying to see how we can tackle, help tackle all the barriers that are confronting the widespread dissemination and adoption of renewable energy technology. Next slide, please. So please go to the next slide. I guess the, 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 all the other the presentations will be available, so let's keep the objectives and go to the next slide. Okay, we're at current status of saying. Yes. So, yes, yeah, so in, in finally we managed to, after all the, the backwards and forwards, we managed to register saying in May 2014, and we have a membership of 120. If you have paying attention, you may have realized that it's slightly lower than what Aneri had shown earlier on, but it's because we are trying to regularize things and we're actually inviting all the previous members to re-register so that uh, the number you see here are those who have re-registered once we formalize the network, but the, the earlier number were the number of, was the number of people who have been with us right from the beginning until this stage. Uh, we have a secretariat that is being hosted by Kite Mine Institution, and we have a website, www forward slash sengana.com. You could go there to see some of the things. It's still, it's still a very new and a, a baby and a website that we're still trying to populate. And we would like to acknowledge the role here that uh, the UN Foundation played because at a point between when we, we became a network 
and being able to get the network registered and all that, we received some tremendous support that is that actually helped us to get to where we are at the moment. Next slide. So going forward, um, now that we are registered and we have the legal authority to, to work and operate as a network, what, what are some of the activities that we want to do this year in the midst of the challenges that we have? We, in, we intend we intend making ourselves visible by getting ourselves involved in the policy discourse, policy debates going on. We want to be able to provide our position as a network on some of the policy decisions. Uh, we want to support a nationwide campaign to promote energy efficiency and conservation because we are in the middle of an energy crisis. Uh, then, more importantly, we need to raise the right funds, um, right amount of funds to drive our activities. So we'll be embarking on a vigorous fundraising uh, activity this year. Uh, meanwhile, our members are involved in various endeavors. Um, we, we heard about Kwesi uh, Wilkins. Wilkins is a member of the network. And Kite, the organization that I had, we are also very much involved. There are so many other private sector entities in the same network who are also actively involved in the promote, promoting energy access in upgrade areas. So next slide, please. So the, 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 this slide is just talking about Kite, um, who we are. Uh, if uh, I think I will be doing a disservice to my organization if I don't say anything about Kite. So we've been at the forefront of promoting NGSX uh, since 1996. And uh, we've done a lot of research advocacy and we developed a number of pilot projects. But we, we want to, as we go into the future, we want to get into actual service provision, providing clean energy solutions in upgrade areas and also providing technological solutions in these areas. So we are in the process of creating a social enterprises, enterprise that would that would do that while the parent organization focuses on the on the research and advocacy work that we're doing. And for you out there who are, who are looking for partners in country, um, I think if you can find a good ally in Kite and you welcome to partner us in the social endeavor. So uh, I will end my presentation here. Great, thank you very much, Ishmael. Um, we are going to go ahead now and um, try um, Wisdom's audio to see if uh, we can get his presentation from him. Hi, Wisdom. Hi, with them? Yes, we can yes, hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, just trying to upload the presentation once again. Wisdom if it's oh very good. Okay. Great. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead with them. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, let me use this opportunity to thank you very much for the excellent setup. I will be speaking briefly on the universal access to modern energy services, the issues, progress, and next steps of the energy. 
kitchen in Ghana. And if you take a quick look at this slide, I mean, looking at the per capita energy consumption and CO2 emissions for selected countries, you will notice that Ghana and many more African countries have very low per capita energy consumption compared to the industrialized and most developed countries, which tells the need for us to increase our access to modern energy services. The next slide also looks at the significant contribution of wood fuels, which I will term combustible renewables, as the World Bank of the World indicates. It's also very high, and it has serious consequences on the environment and the certification. With this in the background, um, the Ghana's energy policy, in line with the Sustainable Energy for All initiative, looks at increasing access to modern energy services and achieving universal access to electricity for productive use by 2016. We also look at diversifying the energy mix so that we devoid from solely relying on our large hydro and the natural gas, which have intermittent challenges. We want to explore other environmentally friendly indigenous sources, including renewable. And for renewables, for renewable energy, the policy is to increase its contribution by 10% for great connection, mini grid, and off grid applications. And we expect to achieve that by the year 2020. We also have a policy to reduce the share of the combustible renewables or the share of wood fuels, mainly firewood and charcoal, in the energy mix to levels below 50%. I believe Paula um, emphasized this. Another policy objective in line with the sustainable energy for all is to ensure and promote the use of efficient and used energy appliances for electricity, wood fuels, and product, um, petroleum products. And in doing all this, our focus is to stimulate or encourage the private sector to participate fully. Taking a look at our energy access, which is the main focus of my presentation, you will observe that we have had tremendous progress as far back as 1990, when access was just around 20-25%. Today, as we talk, or as at December 2013, access rate has increased to a moderate to high level of 76% with well over 6,000 communities currently connected. You will also observe that the increased electrification rate is more pronounced in the south than in the north, and efforts are being made to ensure that the northern part also gets its fair of electricity access. Having said this, let me also say that about two-thirds of the country living in the north consumes just 10% of the electricity that is generated. And this calls for the need to promote productive use in order to stimulate 
agricultural development and small and medium enterprises in the northern sector. And this is why it is one of the focal points of our Sustainable Energy for All initiative. In terms of our progress for renewable energy, I must say that we have made some significant progress since we enacted the Renewable Energy Law. And this law provides the fiscal incentives and regulatory framework to encourage private sector investment. We have provisions such as the fake in tariff, the purchase obligation, net metering, upgrade electrification, promotion of clean cooks, cook stores, I mean establishment of a renewable energy fund. We believe that will play a key role to support most of the social uh, related projects, particularly projects for upgrade electrification, improved cook stoves, among others. And in doing this, there is also a provision to establish a renewable energy authority. For now, we have put in place a number of institutional frameworks. The Energy Commission, the roles are clearly defined. The role of the PURC, the EPA, the Ghana Revenue Authority, the National Petroleum Authority, they all have their clearly defined roles and are putting in place the right regulatory instruments to ensure the smooth implementation of the renewable energy law. We have a few documentations which are currently ready. Most of them are with the Energy Commission. In terms of ongoing activities, for the wind energy, we have been able to undertake assessment. Assessment is actually ongoing detecting poten um, potential sites where measurements are being taken for 60 and 80 meter height. We are also undertaking a biomass resource assessment for power generation. We are doing the feasibility studies for now for three hydropower sites. And we believe all this are to stimulate and attract the private sector to come and invest in it. We have also presented to cabinet enough to get approval to seek parliamentary approval um, to seek parliamentary approval for setting up a renewable energy fund, which we hope will be used to support this project to make them sustainable. I'm sure you are all aware of the 2.5 megawatt solar installation in the northern part of the country, which is operational and we are taking a lot of lessons from it. We have the feeding tariffs gazetted and I must say that now we have well over 37 companies that have been granted provisional license by the Energy Commission. Solar alone we have more than 2,000 megawatts installed, I mean um, applications and the figures go down as you can see on the screen. Let me emphasize that the provisional license does not endorse the capacity requested, but they will, I mean the Energy Commission and the other related regulatory agencies will have to do their due diligence to establish the appropriate capacity that is required for development. But for now, in a nutshell, I will say that in terms of uh, renewable energy, we have well over 57% contribution from large hydros. But when we look at the modern renewable energies, excluding the large hydros, our contribution currently stands at 0.21%. And the projections we have 
for by 2020, targets looking at hydro potentials up to about 300 megawatts, utility wind scale also close to 300 megawatts, utility biomass waste to energy related, we are looking at almost 100 megawatts capacity at target with another 100 megawatt capacity for solar and distributed generations, looking at rooftops and solar systems, wind systems for self-consumption to reduce your electricity consumption. We are targeting close to 50 megawatts. Having said this, let me add that despite the efforts of the ministry to increase access through great extension, there are still a number of communities that are like that are unlikely to be connected to the natu national grid in view of their geographic location. And in view of the fact that we have a target date of 2016 to achieve universal assets, which is very close, our policy is to ensure that we provide many great and upgrade solutions to such communities until such a time that great electricity is extended. We have made a lot of significant progress as far as the upgrade electrification solutions are concerned. We use the private sector as the main driver. Wilkins Engineering, for instance, has been one of the key private companies installing solar systems under different pricing models. We work with a number of other private um, companies involved in this business. And most of our targets looks at solar lanterns, solar home systems, battery charging systems, which we provide with subsidies. We also look at solar facility refrigeration for health facilities, solar systems for public institutions such as security outposts, schools, and other public facilities in communities where there is no grid. We try to support these institutions to have access to clean energy. This is just a rough map which shows the extent of um, how the systems have been distributed. And the map on the right shows the locations that are particularly on the islands. The green spots are the schools, the red spots are the hospitals, the flag are the street lights that have been installed there. We have chips, compounds, and battery charging facilities all installed in most of this. So in brief, I will say that um, we, there is quite a lot more to be done and we have these priority areas and targets which we think we could achieve by the year 2020. We have targets for mini grid electrification, targets for solar home systems, targets for deploying solar lanterns. Let me add that um, we have successfully deployed 20,000 solar street lights through a subsidy scheme, and that has significantly reduced the dependence on currency in most of the rural areas. We hope to achieve 2 million targets by the year 2020. We have targets for upgrade public facilities looking at schools, clinics, and security outposts. We also have targets for putting up pilots, wind, solar water pumps, biogas, solar crop dryers, etc., to support small and medium enterprises, particularly in the agricultural sector. Having said this, let me add that the 
despite the positive uh, impact that has been achieved following the introduction of this upgrade system, there are still a number of challenges. And most of the challenge have to do with the sustainability and affordability of the renewable energy technologies. Kwesi Ajene Mwaten mentioned, highlighted on some of it. For instance, it is, um, even though the renewable energy resource itself is sustainable, the technologies to ensure continuous use of these technologies tend to be unsustainable. Most of them are simply abandoned because the target group do not have the necessary resource or they belong to the lower resource group and cannot afford to pay for the actual cost of replacement. In some cases to for now, most of the products have to be imported and that also has challenges when it comes to repair of these systems. And let me also add that even when you try to import these products, it tends to, we try to encourage tax exemptions in some of these components, but it goes further to discourage local entrepreneurs from going into local assembly. And this is one of the major challenges I would say we have been facing. So in conclusion, let me say that Ghana is committed to the achievement of universal access to electricity by 2016, far ahead of the sustainable energy for all targets. Our focus for the electrification will be um, will be on the productive use of the electricity in order to create wealth and improve the standards of living of particularly the rural people so that we can uh, curb the rural urban migration. However, communities where they are so remote from the grid and are not likely to be reached, we will be giving them the upgrade renewable energy solutions as free electrification options until such a time, until 2030, when we are able to extend grid to most of the communities where it is technically feasible to send the grid. And let me add that the operationalization of the renewable energy fund and the establishment of a renewable energy authority, we believe is one key solution to manage the upgrade sector in order to guarantee its sustainability and to ensure that sustainable resources are used in a sustainable manner over the period. So I would love to end my presentation by appealing to the UN Foundation and the other development partners to support particularly most of our social related projects which are not I mean, uh, economically viable for the private sector to really drive it if there is no support. And we will be very glad to have most of the support to lift up that difficult challenge of disseminating renewable energy to the rural poor in Ghana. Having said this, I would like to say a very big thank you and look forward for questions. Great, thank you, Wisdom. And uh, since the audio issue seems to be uh, somewhat corrected, we will go ahead and try to finish up Paula's webinar now. So just please give us a moment to pull up Paula's presentation.
Hello. This is Paula. I'm sorry for the hate when I was actually presenting. So I'm um, making a follow up on what has been presented by my senior colleague, Ms. Mom. I will quickly go through the SC Forum um, Action Plan for Ghana, looking at the three key objectives. We're looking at promoting productive use of electricity as highlighted by the previous presenter and also um, promoting access to clean and cooking options by um, introducing or promoting sustainable fuel and production and the use of input push tools. Second, another clean and cooking option is to promote access to all input access to LPG for cooking and also promote institutional biogas for getting to public institutions such as schools, hospitals, and prisons. The third objective for Ghana is to provide access to the state for remote communities using public systems was highlighted by my senior colleague this morning. And the productive users of electricity are looking at using electricity to um, promote or uh, to increase agricultural productivity in the form of irrigation. In irrigation, using um, technologies have been as solar, TV, wind, and mini hydro. Also, we're looking at using um, electricity to add value agricultural produce, to add value to agricultural produce in the area of agro-processing. The third is in the fisheries sector to establish landing sites that would use electricity and also um, provide energy for cold storage facilities of the fisheries resources and promote um, agricultural ventures, which is already a common um, venture in Ghana. The fourth and the productive group is to use energy to um, create medium-scale enterprises for soil production. And the objective too, which is improve access to therapy options in the area of sustainable food production and improve food stores. The second is for The regulation perspective that is developing a policy and regulation for promotion and development of the clean food sector. Currently, currently we do not have any um, regulation on quality governing the food food sector of China. So we are working on that. We are also looking at improving the technical and financial capacity of local food manufacturers to increase. Um, the production of input food stores and also um, work on improving the quality in order to serve the purpose of which is being promoted, that is, and to cut down on emissions and also make it um, safe to use. We're also looking at um, establishing wood fuel partitions for charcoal production, that is, um, tackling the issue of um, fuels for cooking. A key thing that we hope to, um, to do under the area of um, cooking is to raise um, public awareness of the benefits of using input cook stove, which is still um, quite low on the Ghanaian um, market. So doing some awareness creation campaigns to um, boost um, consumer use of um, input cook stove and also pilot um, advanced biomass cook stove in public institutions. We have some um, government partners already working in that area. We're also looking at um, um, promoting research and development um, by engaging end users in the design of um, the food food stove um, products to make it um, suitable for whatever you want to use, um, use it for. Because feedback um, shows that um, the stores on the market, some of them are not suitable for certain um, dishes, that is local dishes. So the idea is engage and end users in the design of this um, product. And our R and D also will be um, building the capacity of the local stove manufacturers to leverage carbon financing to be able to um, increase their capacity. In the area of LPG we're looking at issue of supply 
regulation investing in the LPG infrastructure and also improving consumer access. The third option under cooking fuel is to promote the use of institutional biogas system for cooking in selected and schools, hospitals, and prisons. Let me mention that this has been done in the past, but encountering some challenges in its implementation. So the idea is to revisit um, the sector to um, look at the challenges that we're encountering and work on these challenges to be able to have a sustainable um, promotion of biogas systems for cooking. Under Objective 3, which has been extensively already um, presented on by my senior colleague, Ms. Um, is to um, tackle the issue of lightning and um, energy for education in remote um, communities and for health facilities, residential areas, um, island communities, or lakeside communities that haven't yet been raised by the grid, and also to promote the use of energy grid for island communities. As already I mentioned, um, this is a, a snapshot of the targets that have been set by the government of Ghana. That is to achieve 90%, um, which we term as universal asset, by convention by 2016, to um, increase the contribution of renewable energy by 10% in the next generation mix of Ghana by 2020, to have 50% of the Ghanaian population um, using LPG as their main cooking fuel by 2020, and also to have 50%, the remaining 50% of the population using some form of improved mixture for cooking. The fifth and final one is to have 20 and up to 200, sorry, 200 public institutions using biogas as their main cooking fuel. So a recap of the progress made so far has already presented in terms of national electrification. The official figure is 76%, but we are close to hitting 80% as indicated on the slide. In the area of renewable energy, we have about 0.22% um, target they have already achieved. That is looking at grid connected to that of um, 3 megawatts an upgrade system of 0.8 megawatts and biogas, biomass of 2 megawatts. Upgrade system employs so far um, about 41,000. In the area of biogas, we have just secured some funds from the climate support facility to conduct an in-depth feasibility study for the promotion of traditional biogas systems in Ghana. So based on the findings of this study, we will then and come up with the key institutions that would serve as um, the pilot for pushing the use of biogas in Ghana. In the area of improved food stove, um, we can estimate about 800,000 um, stoves already um, sold on the market, which um, we believe are actively being used by households as probably their main um, cooking um, technology or cooking um, fuel choice. For LPG, as at 2010, it was 18%, but we believe this has gone up in the past few years, especially with the introduction of the Ewa LPG program that is currently being um, run by the government of Ghana under the Ministry of Energy and Petroleum with the support of um, partners such as the National Petroleum Authority and the Water Storage and Transport Company of Ghana and the Energy Commission. In collaboration with um, the Ghana Cylinder Manufacturing Company, that is the main um, entity producing the um, cylinders, 5 kg cylinders, and cook stoves for the distribution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula. Glad we were able to um, fix the audio and get your presentation in. Um, and I sent out the message via the question pane to all the attendees, but unfortunately, um, due to the technical difficulties uh, today, which again, I apologize for, uh, we will not be able to get to any of the questions, but um, I will email those out.
uh, to the panelists so that uh, in their own time they'll be able to address those um, and respond directly through email. Um, and now very quickly I'd just like to ask the attendees to participate in a quick survey we have. It is just three brief questions to help us improve. Uh, first question is the webinar content provide me useful information and insight. And the next question is the webinar's presenters were effective. And then the final question is overall the webinar met my expectations. All right, thank you very much for answering our survey. Um, and again, on behalf of the Solutions Center, I'd just like to thank all the panelists again and for the attendees and for participating in today's webinar. And um, we will be making all of the presentations available at the, uh, the first website displayed, the first link displayed on that slide, which is cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training. Um, in addition, we are posting webinars to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel. Um, and we'll be posting an audio recording as well to the Solution Center training page. So uh, please feel free to go out there and uh, look at all the different Clean Energy Solutions resources available um, and also share those with your colleagues and the, those in your networks and organizations. Um, so with that, I'd like to hope everyone has a great rest of your day and we hope to see you at future Clean Energy Solution Center events. And this concludes our webinar.